Reconciliation just happens to have become one of the government's buzzwords for the 90s. Having failed to establish a national program for land rights, and having failed to persuade the opposition to accept the idea outright of a treaty, the government is now pushing this somewhat vaguer notion which will take 10 years to conclude. Tonight we'll try to find out exactly what it means, but first a brief history from Jeannie Walker. I think it would be pretty scandalous if after spending more than 50 million dollars, um, the army of lawyers and judges and God knows who else who have been involved in that process come up with this idea of reconciliation as a significant part of the conclusions. I mean that would be an absolute and utter bizarre and disgusting joke. I'm asking you now, what are you going to do? For many blacks, the government's new reconciliation proposal represents a retreat. Yet another about face in the Holt government's promise to deliver social justice. A back down from the days when former Aboriginal Affairs Minister Clyde Holding toured the country, proclaiming the principles of national land rights. In an area like this, what you have to do is to produce a result which represents immediate justice for those people who have no rights and the broad level of justice uh, for the whole community. But Labour's commitment to Aboriginal rights buckled under the mining industry propaganda which led up to the federal election in 1984. Do you know that as a Western Australian, you're a part owner of your state? Do you think it's fair that less than 3% of our population should claim ownership of up to 50% of our No land. Western Australian should be made an intruder in their own state because land the mining industry believes that land rights should be equal rights. The mining campaign was devastating. It, more than anything, uh, had the effect of changing public opinion. It was one-way traffic. There was a failure by the government to counteract uh, the mining company's campaign. This is why there commenced to be a backlash against uh, the land rights legislation. Well, there's absolutely no doubt that it's probably the most dominant issue in Western Australia at the moment, and it is politically a danger to any government to leave it unresolved. With the federal election fast approaching, Bob Hawke heeded the warning. When Brian Burke declared that no land rights legislation in his state would give Aborigines control over mining, the Prime Minister stood by him, saying that any national legislation would not override the Western Australian position. The government was still committed to national land rights legislation. In February of 1985, the Minister Clyde Holding introduced his preferred national land rights model. And this was very different from the ALP policy. So what happened was that uh, this preferred national land rights model won no friends on the mining side or on the Aboriginal side and was eventually allowed to die a quiet death. And this new law that fouled him on a bottom won a chuck away. The federal government will not go ahead with national Aboriginal land rights. By March 1986, even the watered-down version of national land rights had been discarded. But on a whistle-stop tour of Alice Springs a year later, the Prime Minister moved to take the sting out of the protests planned for the bicentennial year. Stop the hangings, Bob! By raising the prospect of a treaty. I mean, the important thing is that there be a clear statement of understanding by the total Australian community of uh, the obligations that the community has to rectify so many of the injustices that have uh, occurred during that 200 years. But when pressed on the issue a day later, the Prime Minister backed away from the word treaty. I think if you get the attitudes right, the words don't matter very much. In that case, why not call it a treaty? Well, if you uh, rouse undue expectations by a word, if people say that of itself is going to do something, I'm not sure that's wise. Yet the Prime Minister was prepared to raise expectations at Burunga in the Northern Territory in June 1988. That there shall be a treaty negotiated between between the Aboriginal people and the government on behalf of all the people of Australia. When Aborigines presented him with their own treaty claims, he went on to talk of a committee of seven traditional elders and a consultation process culminating in an Australia-wide convention. So that these processes should start before the end of this year and that we would expect and hope and work for the conclusion of such a treaty before the end of the life of this parliament. 
opposition reaction was swift and vehement. The absurd notion of a nation trying to make a treaty with some of its own citizens could be quite horrendous. Mr Howard, would you mind signing this treaty with the Aborigines? Ah, treaty? Ah, no thanks. Uh, I've already got one with the Nationals. 1988 was really the last throw of the dice. That was um, the last chance they had to show um, the Aboriginal people that they had some integrity and honesty in this manner. Uh, in this matter, it was the appropriate time to do it. They failed to do it. It was words. So, to secure bipartisanship, the idea of a treaty was dropped. And under a new Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Robert Tickner, the government now offers a process of reconciliation. This process will involve a council of 25 people, half Aboriginal and half non-Aboriginal, meeting over the next 10 years until the year 2001 to educate the general public about Aboriginal culture and aspirations and to consult widely about whether there should be a formal document. The vagueness of this proposal has been received with scepticism after the firm promise of a treaty only three years ago. Aboriginal activist Gary Foley was amazed to be offered council membership given his views on the policy. Mr Tickner quite specifically asked me to chair the National Committee of Reconciliation. He asked me to be the chairperson of it. And uh, as I say, I was forced to knock him back. What did you think of that request? I was pretty insulted by it because um, anybody who knew anything about the position that I'd taken in relation to the reconciliation package would have known that I was totally opposed to it as a farce and a fraud. Robert Tickner is still courting wider Aboriginal community support for his reconciliation plan. You know, let me make it very clear, um, and again you've got to judge uh, by, by results, but I am not about associating myself with any proposal for an instrument of reconciliation, or call it what you like, that isn't going to be something worth fighting for. Robert Tickner is staking his reputation on this reconciliation process but it will be a long time before we see what it can achieve.